Hello everyone, Tom with Capo Fetish. Today on the channel, we're going to talk about artists that made a huge artistic leap from their debut album to their sophomore album. In just one album, it made a completely different change. Okay? So, we're going to cover about 10 bands here from the 60s through 90s. We're going to start it off here with Love from the 1960s. Their first self-titled album. Fantastic. Very Birds influenced here on this first Love album. A lot of chimey guitars. A lot of that folk rock vibe. Great tracks throughout. My Little Red Book, written by Hal David and Burt Backrack. I guess they weren't real too thrilled about Love's version, so, so I heard, so I read, should I say. Great track about, well, it's very, very dark track, should I say, about heroin addiction called Sign DC. Uh, other songs, uh, Colored Balls Falling, Softly to Me, No Matter What You Do. All very, very Birds influenced, but obviously not exactly sounding like the birds you have their own stamp on it you've got arthur lee heading the band here the leader completely unique visionary so by the second album they are a completely different band de capo de capo however you want to say it completely completely different type of thing going on here on the second love album first of all it's just full of range first side is one of the greatest sides of any 60s album Let's run down the song, shall we? Okay, first we got Stephanie Knows Who, which has these jazz kind of this jazz kind of influence going on in it. Second track, Orange Skies, which has this beautiful like flute playing in it, kind of folk rock with a flute. Gorgeous track written by uh, Brian Mc McLean. Then we got the third track, Kevita, which has kind of these Latin Latin bossa nova kind of vibe going on in here. Seven and Seven is an absolute, you know, all-time classic proto-punk song right in the middle of the side. Then you've got uh, The Castle, which has this, this Spanish guitar kind of influence going on in there. And then the sixth track, this really like psychedelic, weird, bizarre track called She Comes in Colors. Really cool lyrics. Total Arthur Brown dementedness going on. Then on side two, you've got a full, full-on jam called um, Revelation. Goes on for about 17 minutes. I don't really care for that side too much, but the first side is absolutely brilliant and completely showcases a whole different love than their first album. And then, of course, you got Forever Changes coming after that, which showcases a whole other side. So a great example here of a band that really, really changed from their first album to their second album, Love. How about Nirvana, right? If you listen to this first album here, Bleach, you would never know that they would become the biggest band in the world there for a couple of years. Listening to these tracks, there's a few good tracks, but I remember playing uh, shows in my with my band back in the late 80s. We played a lot of shows with bands that sounded like Nirvana, very loud noise type rock bands. And when um, when I heard, first heard this album, I'm like, there's nothing real special about this. There is a track on here called About a Girl, which has very, a very Beatlesque vibe to it, which is cool, which kind of foreshadows what they would do later on the next album. But you look at a lot of these tracks and they're just very, um, they're, they're not real song oriented. It's just more sludge and riff oriented. Blue is a cool track, but a lot of the songs on here I don't care for, like Scoff or Swap Meat or Mr. Mustache. None of this really, really, really hit me in a way like their second album did, which is completely different. So they signed to Geffen and of course released Nevermind in 1991. Call it overrated, call it, you know, overexposed, whatever. It's a fantastic record from start to finish. It's pure ear candy. It's really this amazing combination of loud guitars, screaming, melodic. It's just there's so much packed into these three, four-minute songs. Of course, Smells Like Teen Spirit, overplayed, of course. But the rest of the album is just one great pop track after another. And it's very infectious, and you can see why. This album made such an impact, especially when you were, it was coming out of the whole hair metal era, all that fake bullshit that was going on. This was just like real stuff, like made by real people that were formed in a garage. And, uh, I, you know, Kurt Cobain's songwriting, too, just, came, just took an absolute giant leap on this record. You know, you got a couple of real kind of mellow tracks in both sides, Something in the Way and Polly. But you just can't deny the greatness of songs like On a Plane, you know, In Bloom, Come As You Are, um, Lounge Act, Stay Away. I mean, it's all very infectious and, I mean, completely radical from the first album to this album, from Bleach to Nevermind. So that's another example, Nirvana. 
How about Bob Dylan? Bob Dylan's first ca album came out. Didn't really sound like anybody else, but half of the album was full of covers, right? This is uh, you know, him playing the Greenwich Village clubs in the early 60s, you know, doing songs like, um, you know, Baby Let Me Follow You Down. And he does his own version of House of the Rising Sun, which I think the Animals did the best cover of. He writes a few of his own songs on here, but by the second album, Free Will and Bob Dylan, he's pretty much invented the whole singer-songwriter genre. Completely giant leap here for Dylan. And then from every album onward, it was a big leap. But uh, I mean, what can you say about this album? I mean, it's just absolutely, just an absolute masterclass in songwriting from start to finish, blowing in the wind. Girl from the North Country, Masters of War, Down the Highway, Bob Dylan's Blues, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. Very timely song in 2024, right? Then you get Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, a song covered by many, many artists, right? And on and on, Talking World War III Blues, Karina, Karina, I Shall Be Free. Incredible album. So a big leap there from Bob Dylan from the first album to Free Will and Bob Dylan from 1963. Another band, Radiohead. A lot of people don't like their first album, Pablo Honey. There's like elements of grunge. They're trying to be maybe kind of on the fringe of grunge on this album, but there's little hints of what's to come. The last track on here called Blow Up kind of shows where they're going to go in the future. I don't think this is a bad album at all. I've never understood really the hate for this album. I'm tired of the song Creep, but there's some great songs on here like Vegetable, um, Anyone Can Play Guitar, Thinking About You, Prove Yourself, Lurgy. I think it's a fine album, but their second album is completely miles away from Pablo Honey, and that is The Benz. This is an absolute, like, remaking of Radiohead. I guess what happened was Tom York saw Jeff Buckley play live and was so blown away that he, you could hear the influence of Jeff Buckley and Tom York's voice on this album, that, that soprano, that falsetto voice. Starting off with Planet Telex, The Benz, but by the time you get to the third track, this is a whole different Radiohead, high and dry, with those acoustic guitars and that infectious chorus. Then you got Fake Plastic Trees, which is just, it was unimaginable on an album like Pablo Honey, from just, a, just from an album prior. Bones Rocks, you got really, really dreamy kind of atmospheric songs like Nice Dream, rockers like Just and My Iron Lung with all these really incredible dynamics. Uh, Bulletproof is an incredible, like, slow, moody, atmospheric track. Black Star Sulk, and it ends with Street Spirit. And some of these songs on here would highlight what where they go next with um, the, the album OK Computer. But completely radical difference here between Pablo Honey and the Benz from Radiohead here, from first album to sophomore. How about Neil Young's first album? Great album. Very produced, though. Very produced. Um... There's a lot of orchestration on here. Uh, his voice is a little more subdued than on later records. That kind of whining Neil Young voice isn't really showcased on this album yet. Some fantastic tracks on here all over the place. Uh, the Loner, if I, if I Could Have Her Tonight, I've Been Waiting For You. Um, you've got Here We Are In The Years, What Did You Do To My Love, What Did You Do To My Life, I've Loved Her So Long. Very just, very kind of almost soft folk rock a little bit of orchestration on here, but by the second album, everybody knows this is nowhere. Just like Neil Young, Dung, Neil Young does throughout his whole life, he completely uh, reimagines himself and comes up with this garage rock classic, which sounds nothing like the debut album. He hires this band Crazy Horse, which would follow him along off and on throughout his career after this album. And uh, you've got a whole different Neil Young. Starting out with Cinnamon Girl, just incredible, just just raw rock and roll. Uh, everybody knows this is nowhere. Just great kind of rock, country rock. Then you've got some like really moody tracks on here, like Round and Round and Running Dry. Just really atmospheric and moody and dark. Then you've got, then the album is highlighted by two of the songs that end side one and side two, Down by the River, Cowgirl in the Sound. Just great jam rock tunes with infectious verses and choruses. Yeah. A completely different album than his debut and one of the greatest albums ever made. Everybody knows this is nowhere. His sophomore album, Neil Young. How about Blur? Blur, I just got into them the, the, the start of the year. And I have most of their albums except the, uh, the latest one. And uh, there is a huge difference between their uh, debut and the sophomore. Their first album, Leisure, 
came out in 1991. They're still kind of riding the crest of that kind of shoegaze vibe, which the Stone Roses did. It sounds very Stone Roses to me, but without the great songs, there's, there's some great things happening here though in this band. First of all, they have an incredible guitarist, Graham Coxon, who can play so many different styles and do all these styles really well. They have an amazing rhythm section with David Roundtree on drums and Alex James on bass. So they're laying the groundwork for further further greatness here, but this isn't really like this isn't really the blur sound. Move forward a couple years later to their second album here, Modern Life is Rubbish. They are a completely different band writing absolute top-tier songs on this album. The arrangements are amazing, the harmonies are amazing, the guitar playing, the whole production is amazing on this album. From start to finish, you've got For Tomorrow, which was a huge single in the UK. This album, by the way, did nothing here in the US. Shame, because it's fantastic. Advert, Colin Zeal, they have these great uh, harmonies between uh, Damon Auburn and, uh, and Graham Coxon throughout the album. Just amazing, amazing hooks. You know, hooks that are like, anybody would die to have in a band, right? Songs like Star Shaped the, and, and ballads like Blue Jean, Blue Jeans, Chemical World, just incredible. Like a whole completely different band. And Blur, like a lot of other bands, they would just keep progressing from album to album. The next album, Park Life, is way more, has a lot of more range, incredible songs, and on and on. They were always changing from album to album, but from their first to the second here, like on Modern Life is Rubbish, they are a completely different band and they are moving in an amazing direction. And I would give this album here an absolute five star rating without question, incredible stuff. Other great tracks on here, Miss America, kind of, uh, kind, of, kind of folky, psychedelic, oily water, a little more psychedelic going on in there. You got Sunday Sunday, which is kind of reminiscent of the kinks. There's a lot of kinks influence all over this, but they do it in their own way. Coping, Villa Rosie, one of the most catchy songs ever written. So there you go, Blur, from Leisure to uh, Modern Life is Rubbish, completely different band. James Taylor, his first album on Apple Records from 1968, self-titled, has some fine songs on here. Something in the Way She Moves, Carolina In My Mind, but not really that striking of a debut. But how about that second album, all right? He completely changes. His songwriting is absolutely perfection on Sweet Baby James from 1970. He moves from Apple to Warner Brothers. This album's huge. There's, this is one of the greatest singer-songwriter albums of all time. Every track on here from beginning to end is fantastic. The title track, Sweet, Sweet Baby James. Lo and Behold, Sunny Skies, which has this kind of beatles kind of melody. You got Country Road on here. Oh, he does a version of Oh, Susanna. Of course, uh, the hit Fire and Rain. Blossom is another just beautiful little pop tune. You've got uh, Anywhere Like Heaven with this really great pedal steel on it. Um, and then you've got this incredibly, uh, like, multi-part, incredible track that ends side two, the end of the album, Sweet for 20G. So uh, James Taylor goes from, like, a, an average artist on the first album to an absolutely top-tier artist on Sweet Baby James. Now, I don't have his first album. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Blowing Your Mind, Van Morrison, but it features Brown-Eyed Girl, and it features TV Sheets and a, and a cover of... Um, of a midnight special but by the time his second album comes out on warner brothers he is a completely different artist and i'm talking about astral weeks there's so much going on in this album some people really really overrate this album i love this album but I, sometimes i think it's a little overrated but i still think it's an incredible artistic statement you've got everything going on here folk folk blues almost like free form poetry going on classical Jazz and it all—it all just seems so natural. It's like the these guys are playing and he's just singing. It seems like stuff is just coming out of his mouth. Songs like Madam George sounds like he's just making up lyrics, making up poetry as the, as the songs play on. You've got songs like Ballerina, same thing. He's just he's just spitting out verse, verse and verse going on. Astral Weeks, the title track, Cypress Avenue, Slim Slow Slider. There's a song on here called Young Lovers Do, which Jeff Buckley does live at Sin E. Does an amazing version of that track. This is one of those milestone albums. And 
he went from like, it's really amazing when you think about the, traje the trajectory of Van Morrison, you know, starting off with that garage band Them with uh, Gloria and Here Comes the Night. Then he signs to, I think it's the Bang label, puts out uh, Blow in Your Mind. He's kind of progressing a little bit. And then he completely, completely changes his whole vibe here on Astral Weeks from 1968. So this is another example. Steely Dan, their first album, Can't Buy a Thrill. Fantastic debut. A lot, probably their most pop-oriented album, at least from their early stages. Huge hits, reeling in the years. Uh, Do It Again. There's some fine stuff on here. Only a Fool would say that. Um, obviously, right off the bat, they have just absolute like studio player musicians playing on these albums, like Jeff, Jeff Skunk Baxter, Donald Fagan, of course, Walter Becker, Denny Diaz. Um, fantastic record, but more pop-oriented. But by the second album, Countdown to Ecstasy, the musical prowess is growing. The songs are longer, more sophisticated. You've got Boasatva, which is really like this kind of uh, rocker, bluesy kind of track with just amazing guitar work. Razor Boy, the Boston Rag with this great midsection, instrumental section. Uh, your Gold Teeth, a long track, that inside one, same thing. And then you've got like, of course, just great, great tracks featuring amazing guitar from uh, Jeff Skunk Baxter, like on My Old School. Beautiful ballads like Pearl of the Quarter. King of the World, Steely Dan from here and then would progress from album to album, kind of like the Beatles. But a big change from Camp by a Thrill to Countdown to Ecstasy from 1973. And then last on the list, this is a radical departure here too. I already mentioned this album uh, maybe a couple videos ago, but first Buffalo Springfield album, very folk rock, very folk rock oriented, kind of keeping in with uh, you know the birds and a lot of those folk rock bands in the mid 60s. Uh, a lot of great tracks on here, a lot written by Neil Young and Stephen Stills, many tracks sung by Richie Ferre, Flying on the Ground is Wrong, Burned, fantastic debut. But by the second album, they're, they're already splintering, and you can already tell that each of the writers, they're, they're all becoming their own kind of writer. But even the production, the music has completely changed on Buffalo Springfield again. They sound like a different band than the first album. It's evident from the first track. Nothing on the first Buffalo Springfield rocks as hard as Mr. Soul. It starts this album off. You've got Country Rock, Child's, Fam Child's Claim to Fame, written by Richie Ferre. They're all writing amazing. Every Days by Stephen Sills has this kind of lounge act jazz vibe. Expecting to Fly almost sounds like a Tangerine Dream. It's very a dream pop. You got Bluebird, which features just the most amazing jam, like the most amazing, like, acoustic guitar jams going on along with the fuzzed out guitars hung upside down great psychedelic fuzzed out uh psychedelic track sad memory beautiful track by richie ferre good time boy even dewey martin behind the drums gets into his like otis redding vibe then you got rock and roll woman which kind of foreshadows csnn and why those those harmonies and then broken arrow by neil young which is very experimental um and just incredible so Buffalo Springfield, again, sounds nothing like their debut album. And they made a huge artistic leap on this album. So those are 10 examples, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you have any more examples to throw in, put them in the comment section. As always, thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, it's free. Just press subscribe. I'd appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.